Do you ever find yourself <clears throat> in a place where um, you need to hear? Do you ever put yourself in a place of being talked to? It's hardly ever necessary, right? Hmm. There's a few pictures of being talked to about stuff in your life. Maybe a correction, getting counsel, hearing a rebuke, help, sharpened. Do you put yourself in that place? I especially like this picture up here. As a matter of fact, I have a whole bunch of these, a lot more than I put up here. And I like this one because I've felt that way. Have you? I felt that way yesterday. Hmm. Being talked to. Some of these, if you could bring them up close, you would catch the, uh, the impression. This one is good. I like that one, especially the response. Putting yourself in a place of being talked to. You know that is proverbial. For example, Proverbial wisdom. Proverbs is about wisdom for living with people. Notice this. Where there is no counsel, the people fall. Means they wipe out. They don't succeed. But in the multitude of counselors, there's safety. Notice this one. Without counsel, plans go awry. But in the multitude of counselors, they're established. There's, there's success. They succeed. That's what that idea is. And that's all proverbial. Those are the proverb references. Proverbs <clears throat> is about wisdom for living here on earth with God and with people says that about putting yourself in a place to be talked to, to be corrected, to be sharpened. Do you put yourself in that place? Here, this one. For by his wise counselor, counsel, you will wage your own war. Look at this. You will wage your own war. Your own war. He's not talking about the campaigns of uh, the Indian-British War. He's talking about you dealing with your battles. By wise counsel, you will wage your own battles. You'll deal with them. And in a multitude of counselors, there's security. So, by wise counsel, wage war. Do your battles. Handle those issues. Face those problems. Deal with what comes along. It's Proverbs. Wisdom for living here on earth now. And yet on the other hand, Proverbs also talks about not doing this. Whoever isolates himself, seeks his own desire, he backs off. <laughs> then they're urgent, tied up in what they want, and he breaks out against all sound judgment. Sound point, <laughs> fight against that. This is the other side of the Proverbs, and not having an ear to hear. As a matter of fact, Jesus said that frequently. He said it his last messages to the church. He who has an ear to hear. Here, do you put yourself in a place to be talked to about the stuff in your life? Oh, Sunday? Yeah, we need that. And during the week? 
with a brother or a sister in the Lord. Maybe a brother or sister in the flesh. Maybe a parent. Do you? This goes on in Proverbs. A fool has no delight in understanding, but in expressing his own opinion. I'm not going to listen. I just want to talk. Hmm. Do not correct a scoffer, lest he hate you. Reprove a wise man and he will love you. Proverbs says he will be wiser still. Those are the other side of listening. Choosing to not listen. So, he who heeds wise counselor, wise counsel is wise. Question that I posed here was, do you put yourself in a place to be talked to? To let someone correct you, reprove you, rebuke you? Most of us would rather be the one giving the correction than getting. True? Yep, that kind of goes along with this. A fool delights in a... Not, well, okay, got it, right? That's where most of us, but it takes both. It takes getting and giving. It takes both. This morning, we come to the life of the Apostle Paul as he finishes his third journey. And as we do, we see him getting and giving, talking to's, reproof. Rebuke. As a matter of fact, the scriptures tell us the reproofs of instruction are the way of life. Do you buy that? For us, this is the way life is. The reproofs of instruction are the way of life. It's how it is for us. And the Apostle Paul, I'm going to ask you to turn with me to Acts chapter 20. Where we're going to look in on this stuff of life, the stuff of life and the Apostle Paul. Chapter 20 of the book of Acts. Turn there with me, and what we're going to look at as we do this is we're going to look at a statement that is used, and I'm going to use, I did not shrink back. If you're with me, in the book of Acts, chapter 20, we've just come through the riot in Ephesus. What a riot that was. You remember that? I would love to go through that again because it's absolutely crazy what happens. People chanting about their goddess who fell for heaven and she is the one. And it goes nuts for a long time. People in there shouting and yelling and jumping and, and they don't even know what it's all about. Just, wow, it's exciting. And the guy has to threaten with legal proceedings to get it under control, the officials of the town. Chapter 20, verse 1, and after the uproar ceased, Paul sent for the disciples, and after encouraging them, he said farewell, and he departed for Macedonia. And after he had gone through those regions, I'm going to put up here a map. This is the third missionary journey. This is the last leg. We are here. Okay, we've just been in Ephesus, and so here, and that was nutso. So the Apostle Paul 
does this. Follow me along. He said farewell, and he departed and went up to Macedonia. Right there. Macedonia. And he sees these guys around here. Berea is not up there, but it should be. And he does that. And when he had gone through those regions that I just showed you, he given them much encouragement, he came to Greece. Right there. At Corinth. Now, when he was up here in Macedonia, he wrote the second letter to the Corinthians. That's why we just went through there. It was an exciting thing because they were being changed. And he encourages them that, about we are being changed. And he talks to them about areas of change. And when he came down to Corinth there at Greece, he writes the book to the Romans, which is up over there. He writes the book to the Romans, which we just went through. And he explains the experience of salvation from God's point of view. That's what Romans is. 1 Corinthians, people with problems. 2 Corinthians, we're being changed. Romans, explaining salvation from God's point of view. I hope that you can explain the experience of salvation from your point of view. When you came to Christ, when? How? And what changes it brought? Surely, you should be able to do that, to give that testimony. That's the intent. Romans explains it from God's point of view. We just went through that with our D-band and what fun that was. I won't do it here. He is there in Corinth when he writes those letters to Rome. There, in Greece. And this happens. There, verse 3 of chapter 20, he spent three months. And when a plot was made against him by the Jews, as he was about to sail for Syria, okay, this is Syria, right there. That is Antioch of Syria. There's another Antioch over here, but we're talking about the one in Syria. He's about to sail to there on a big ship, on a straight shot, nonstop. And when he's planning to do that, because he wants to, as we know from other scriptures, get to there... And then down to Jerusalem by the Passover because he's carrying a big gift that has been given by the churches in that area to help out the believers in Jerusalem. As he's doing that, he is counseled that there is a plot against him so that on that ship, they're planning, the Jews, on taking him out. It's not going to be a tough target in such a small area. And they're out there at sea, and a whole bunch of Jewish pilgrims going for Passover. And who Paul has become to them? The plan, the plot, is to take him out. And through counsel, Paul learns of the plot to take him out. And so, he changes his plan. Oh, how about that? I'm going to change my plan. There's a point here that I want us to make. Or I want to make with you. And the point is, Be open to change. Paul had to change his plans. 
His plans were very clear in Romans chapter 5. Well, verse 22 is actually where it starts rather than verse 2. Or in Romans chapter 15, verse 22 through 29, his plans are very clear what he intends to do. I can run them to you quickly. What he plans to do is to run down to Jerusalem at the Passover, deliver this gift, turn around and head back that same way, going to Rome first and spending time there because he's never seen them face to face. That's what he says in the book of Romans. He's never seen them, but he wants to go there and in part will be encouraged, he says, with them one with another and have some fruit as he explains for salvation from God's point of view. And then he's going there merely for the purpose of not only seeing them, but going to Spain, where the gospel has not been established. That's his plan. And now he's got to change that plan because he's got counsel. Paul, you know this ship that you're going to get on? They're planning on killing you. No! You know, the Lord will take care of me. I've been through this stuff before. You know what I mean? I can handle it. Here we go. I'm going. He listens to counsel. He's open to change. Don't shrink back. being open to change from counsel. You know, how easy is it for you to change plans? Do you like to have plan changes? How do you do when your plans have to change? Well, it depends on how much I wanted to do it or not. How much? I would rather have them change than do that. Right. I want to go to Rome. I'm going to go to Jerusalem first because I've got to take this gift and then I'm going to come back to Rome and then I'm going to go to Spain and I... Change. You know, the older we get, the more routines we put in life, the more we don't like them to change. Man, when it change, I get so off schedule, you know? I can't even think straight. Hmm actually happens as time goes on. Hmm. Be open to change. Because sometimes God is in that change. Hmm. Maybe I need to add this. Frequently God is in that change. In the course of life, this is what the Apostle Paul says is happening. We look to the Lord and we are being changed. If you're not changing, you're not growing like God intended. I've had people who sat across from me and said, I haven't changed in years. And that kind of tells me a whole bunch about how their relationship with the Lord's going. You know what I mean? I haven't changed in years. It's not a basis for pride. It's a basis for repentance. We need to change. We need to be growing. You need to be identifying it. You need to have a member of your family say to you, you know, you have so changed in. You need to. You need to. We need to be open to change. This is proverbial. Notice. Poverty and shame will come to him who disdains correction. I won't be talked to. But he who regards a rebuke 
will be honored. It's the way of life. These reproofs of correction. Paul, the Apostle Paul, changed. Now, it's kind of wise to say a rebuke in a manner that makes it a little bit easier to embrace. Have you ever noticed that? This one or that one makes it a little harder. But if it comes across this way or that way, then you don't have to listen to it, right? Sometimes it's so emotionally charged when it comes across that way because how important it is to the one who's telling you. Amen? So even though it's not said nicely, it doesn't become the excuse for not listening. Amen? Hmm. Sometimes it's only when they come to the end of the rope that they're going to tell you what you really need to hear anyway. True? So a rebuke taken is honored. But you always have to decide in counsel. Counsel is not forced to do. That's slavery. That's imprisonment. Counsel is offered and you choose to decide with it or not. I've counseled for a lot of years and one of my most cherished statements in dealing with an issue of change is to say, you know, you can choose to do whatever it is you want to do. Within limits, I mean, we couldn't live in 1884 right now, but you can choose to do whatever it is you want to do. This is what God says. And you can choose, because it's always a decision. It needs to stay that way. It needs to. So, proverbial, open to change. Second, as we see that in Paul, I want to bring up this too. Don't shrink back from being caring, and yet persistent. I want you to see this story, because it's very interesting, this story. Do you remember the story about Paul going to Troas, because he talks about some people, if you look at verses 4 and following, all these people were with him, and they were being his counselors, his helpers, his associates, his assistants. As of course, he was carrying this big offering, and they were all with him, and they were interacting, and he takes this trip, and instead of going a straight shot to Syria, he goes, he decides to do this, he returns through Macedonia. If I'd had the map up here, I'd show you what he did, and he kind of popped around a little bit and took little jaunts on the ship. And he talks about verse 5, and they went ahead of us, and they sailed through Troas and from Philippi and unleavened bread, so he missed the Passover, and they stayed there for seven days when they arrived at Troas. And on the first day of the week, verse 7, on the first day of the week, which was their worship day, like as ours, when we had gathered together to break bread, Paul talked with them, intending to depart on the next day, Monday. And he prolonged his speech until midnight. That was a long meeting. He went to midnight. Now, there's a point here that needs to be made, okay? Sleeping during a message can be fatal. drowsiness and sleep. you need to go to bed before so you're bright eyed and bushy tailed amen but Saturday night Saturday Saturday night it's time for sleeping <sighs> can be fatal there's a young man sitting in a windowsill. You know the story, right? What happened? Lamps were burning, crowded room. They didn't have the ventilations we do. He was sitting there. 
You know, I had a kid, one of my kids, who used to take wet claws with them to the service. Because they, because they wanted to stay awake. They were little. They wanted to stay awake. They, they, and they'd wipe their face trying to stay awake. And then, pretty soon you'd look over. <laughs> He's wanting to stay awake in that windowsill. He's bleeding out to get some fresh air. Ah, ah, mm. Third floor, what happens? <laughs> you know, my wife's grandmother didn't like preachers very much. You know, because they talked so much. There was one time that she met a preacher, and he shook her hand. And when he shook her hand, he said, Oh my, calluses on your hand. And she said, I'd rather have them there than somewhere else. Because she thought preachers were kind of lazy. They spent a lot of time What conclusions are you drawing? I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> well, my wife's grandmother spoke about a time when she was at a service and a preacher was preaching and carrying on and going at it and all of a sudden some lady in the service fell over, fainted right there on the spot. And he didn't interrupt his message. He didn't say anything about it. He kept on preaching. She didn't like preachers very well. And I want you to know, when the Apostle Paul went to midnight, he didn't keep going when the kid fell out the window. Okay, look with, me. Oops. look with me, just to keep me on my toes. Look with me at verse 10. He just fell out of the third story window, overcome by sleep, verse 9. And when Paul went down and bent over, he stopped his message. He's, this is important stuff. He's leaving. And he stopped his message and he went down and he bent over and he took the boy up in his arms. And he said, don't be alarmed for his life is in him. And he picked him up. He definitely died. I mean, Luke, who is talking here, was an MD and he said the kid died. He picked him up. And his life was in him. And look at the end of this down at verse number 12, and they took the youth away alive and were not a little comforted. There was a great deal of encouragement there. The point that I'm making here is Paul obviously cared. Don't shrink back. I need to say something very important. The thing that most underscores what you say when you talk to someone is how much you care. Do you think that our criticizing and our being down on President Obama and this current administration is going to help them hear us. What underscores what you say 
is how much you care. In the counseling training that we've gone through, here's counsel to you. If you don't care, get out of counseling. Because we're not attempting to feign empathy. You need to have empathy. I'm reading a book called Vanishing Grace. Stay up late to read it. Do you know that Jesus was full of grace and truth and he went everywhere doing good? God is of such a nature that he lets his sunshine and his rain on the evil and the good. Have you noticed that? In this book called Vanishing Grace, he talks about how grace is going away from the church so that those who are bearing good news aren't good news to people. They're bad news, expressing slamming and cutting and undermining and hatred and all of that from the church. You know, if there ought to be some folks who are loving, I mean, Jesus said this, all men will know that you are my disciples because you are so critical of all the stuff that doesn't go God's way. That's how they'll know that you are my disciples because you have this critical stuff for everything that is ungodly. Amen? No. What did he say? By your love. By your caring. Your decision to do what's best for another person regardless of how you feel or what the consequences are. I have some strong feelings. Do you? This will do it. That you care. And it will underscore what you say. Because people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Paul obviously cared. Yet he was persistent. I want you to see how persistent he was. Look at this. And when he had gone up and broke bread and eaten, he conversed with them a long while until daybreak, and then he departed. That's pretty persistent, isn't it? They went until the sun rose. I like that. You know, it's, sometimes it's kind of hard to break away from fellowship. Yesterday morning at the D-Band, we had a great time. And when we were done, it was just kind of, all just kind of stood around at the end. I mean, we needed to go. We all knew we needed to go because we got, but it was like, kind of hard. As a matter of fact, in this passage, they're going to talk about how they tear themselves away from it. He was persistent. In verses 14 through 17, his persistence continues. Notice this. And so... He goes on this trip and Paul decided to sail on and he's still, verse 16, trying to get Jerusalem, if possible, by the day of Pentecost. And as he was going, verse 16, he decides to sail right past Ephesus. He's going to go whoosh, right on past. Why didn't he stop and see him? It's a big church. He's going to spend a long time there. He knows he's going to be involved in stuff, and he still, since he couldn't make Passover, he wants to get Pentecost. You know how Pentecost comes after, Pente after Passover. I won't go through that. 
And so when he doesn't talk to him, verse 17, he goes down to Miletus and he sends to Ephesus and he calls the elders of the church to come to him. And they came to him. They came to talk to him. Now we're going to get into some straight up, don't shrink back stuff here. Okay, don't shrink back from being open to change. Don't shrink back for being caring yet persistent. Persistent. They're not going to hear you if you don't care. And if you give up, well, we don't give up. We never give up. Because we win. We don't give up. Now this one is the major one. It's about don't shrink back. It starts here at verse 17 and it goes on through the end. 21.16. So he calls for the elders and they come to him, verse 18. And he says, You know how I lived among you the whole time from the first day I set foot in Asia, serving the Lord with humility and with tears and with trials. He's talking about the caring and the persistence that he had. What happened to me throughout the plots of the Jews? And notice verse 20. What does he say? How I did not shrink back. He talks to him, verse 20. And as he goes on in this conversation down to verse 27, he says this, and now he says, verse 27, for, excuse me, for I did not shrink back. Verse 27. I did not shrink. You know this word shrink back is a very, very interesting word. I wrote it down on a card just so I remember it. In case you want to know, this is word number 5,288 in Strong's Grammatical Exegetical Dictionary Concordance. Dictionary is a concordance. And it says this. You needed to know where that word was at, didn't you? To shrink back means to withhold under, like out of sight. It means to cover over, to conceal, to draw back, or to shun, to withdraw. That's to what shrink back is. Paul says, I did not shrink back from. Two times. What did he, what did, what, what did he not shrink back from? What's he not shrinking back from? Hey, message, okay? The message. What, what was the message containing? Look at verse 20. What does he say I didn't shrink back from? Verse 20, Acts 20. What did he not shrink back from? What did he not shrink back from? Okay, from what was profitable to them. What was going to be beneficial to you in my talking to you? In my giving, and you're getting, I did not cover up, withdraw, cover over, withhold, conceal from you anything that was profitable. Do you ever have to talk to somebody? I need to talk to you. I need to talk to you. What do you, what do you go after? You know, it really bothers me that you... What, what are you after? Clarity? That's important when you're saying it, but what are you wanting to be clear about? I don't like it that. Why do you always, you never, what do you go after? Something that may be, pardon me? 
You should, you should, but often it's what irritates us, right? It really irritates me that, isn't it? I don't know. You're all different than me. Paul says, I didn't shrink back. I didn't cover over. I didn't slight. I did not withhold from you anything that was profitable for you. That's what he says, verse 20. How I did not shrink back from declaring to you anything that was profitable to you. I was teaching you. I was covering this publicly and from house to house. I went and saw you in your house and I didn't withhold it. And go up to verse 27. How I did not shrink back from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. This is what I want to talk to you about. I want to talk to you about how God sees this. What God says on this. What God has. And in comparison, what we're doing. Declaring the whole count. I want you to know I've noticed something. And as we've been throwing through the Bible, the Bible, its story, and the Bible is a story. It is one story from beginning to end. It is one story. It has a whole bunch of stories in it. And all of these stories support the story from beginning to end. And we could kind of do that here, but I don't want to right now. We're going to do that a little bit later. Not today. But not right now. There is one story. But I've noticed as we've gone through this story, one of these supporting stories that we have missed out on, and we're going to correct during Christmas season, is the story about the counsel of God. There's a huge section of the Bible that's called wisdom. It's called wisdom. Wisdom is about the best course to take in life. Proverbs is about living with people and the best course to go. Psalms, which is poetic literature, talks about living with God. Job, suffering problems. Ecclesiastes, this whole thing about life doesn't fall into nice straight categories. There are, but there's meaning here. All of this wisdom, and we're going to culminate it and he who is made to us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. This child, this child that's born to us. And we're going to cover that during Christmas season. So, next week, New Testament wisdom, Book of James. And following that, we're going to talk about a little bit of this Old Testament. And then on December 14th, as we approach Christmas, we're going to talk about this wisdom of counsel that God gives to us. <laughs> for unto us, for unto us. And on the 21st, we have our Christmas program. And then after that, mm hmm. I can't wait. My favorite book of the Bible. We'll find out. Nate already knows. Kaylee already knows. No, I'm not telling you. <laughs> Ask them. We're going to cover this wisdom. What did he not draw back from? from giving him this wisdom. And this will be the result of this wisdom. Look with me, verse 22. And Paul says, And now behold, I'm going to Jerusalem, constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me and in every city that imprisonment and affliction await me. Let's go. 
I thought we were dealing with wisdom here. Verse 24. But I don't account my life as of any value, nor as precious to me, if only I may finish my course and the ministry that I received from the Lord. You know, you aren't going to get out of this world without trouble. I just want my life to be peaceful. Sorry, not happening. I've had believers. I've had so much trouble in my life, I just want everything to go well. You know where that is? That's in heaven when Jesus rules. And we're not there yet. And guess what? God doesn't intend us to be there yet. Because if he did, we would be. Amen? So, you know what we can anticipate? We can anticipate problems and trials and difficulties. We can anticipate that and knowing that God is working them all together for good. That's what we can anticipate. And we won't draw back because we will have courage with this. We will be courageous. We will be. We will be. And we will not draw back. We will not draw back from presenting what's profitable, presenting the whole counsel of God. We will not draw back. We will not. We will not shrink. We will not cover it. And it will bring problems. At the end of this message, we have two folks. One who's going to talk about overseas ministry. We're going to have one talk about ministry here in the USA. Two people. And they're people in our fellowship. They're going to be talking to us about that. Because ministry will bring adversity. Guarantee it. I guarantee it. Unless you're going to fake it or be a fair haired boy that's always sweet and positive and never giving the whole counsel of God, it will bring adversity. And that's what Paul said, I anticipate. Don't be surprised. Here it comes. that I may finish my course and the ministry. You know, the Apostle Paul was the only one who had received ministry, right? He says, the ministry I received from the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Apostle Paul is the only person because he was so, so... so, Apostle Paul walked about this far off the ground. His feet never touched the ground. Because God had so... He was the man. And he was the only one that God ever used in ministry. Right? Wrong. Who else has ministry? You do? You do? Do you really? I mean you. Do you really have ministry from the Lord Jesus Christ to do? Look at this. As each one has received a gift, this is Bible, by the way, as each one has received a gift, minister it. What? This gift that you have received to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. I would love to preach on this verse, but I can't. It just says here that there is a multifold grace of God that's given to you in one gift package that you're to minister from. That's what he says. And he says, this belongs to who? Each one. Each one. I want you to know, there is no elevated class of people who are clergy, who minister. They don't exist. The priesthood was done away with when Jesus came our high priest only In this sense, there's no special group. There's a priesthood, and that priesthood is you. You're the go-between. You go to God for people, and you go to people for God, and you have the ministry. Specially gifted. 
And when the Apostle Paul writes about this, he says, therefore, since we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we do not lose heart in this, even though it comes to difficulties that arise sometimes. We do not lose heart. And what was this ministry? Look at what he says here. What this ministry was. Here it is, summarized, that this ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus Christ, verse 24, to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. That's your ministry. That is an excellent summary of the ministry. It's good news about God's unearned, undeserved favor that we communicate. And the Apostle Paul goes and he talks about how he commends them to the word of God to build them up in this. He goes from Jerusalem. He talks about his going. Look at how this goes. I want you to see this. He, he leaves there and they don't want him to leave. Okay? He says, now I commend you to God, verse 32, and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are set apart to God, who are sanctified. And, and then when he's leaving, and when he had said these things, verse 36, he knelt down and he prayed with them, and there was much weeping on the part of all, and they embraced him and they kissed him, being sorrowful, most of all because of the words that he had said that they're not going to see his face, and he departed from them. Verse 21, and he had a, that as the word there where he had to tear himself apart from them. That was the fellowship they didn't want to leave. And, and so he went on. He got on the ship and he went on and um, he sailed. He left to Syria and Cyprus and, and he got to Tyra. Look at verse 4. And having sought out the disciples, he stayed there with them for seven days. And through the Spirit, they were telling him, don't go to Jerusalem. And when the days were ended, they all brought out their wives and their kids and they knelt down in the breach, beach and they prayed together and they farewell and he had to leave. And on the final voyage, he's going to finish this, he's going to arrive at the end of his journey. He comes to Caesarea. He's finally landed back in the Middle East and he goes and stays with Philip who had four daughters and a guy named Agabus comes down and he takes Paul's belt and he wraps himself and his hands and his feet. And look at what he says, verse 11. Thus says the Holy Spirit, this is how the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. And when we heard this and the people heard it, they urged him, don't go to Jerusalem. And Paul answered, look at this, verse 13. He says, why are you doing this? What are you doing? Weeping and breaking my heart. For I'm ready not only to be imprisoned, but even to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And since he wouldn't be persuaded, then we all said, well, let the will of the Lord be done. <laughs> well, how about that? <laughs> That's a good idea. <laughs> and after these days, they got ready and they went to Jerusalem. And he went there. Ministry. Do you know why? Do you know why Paul is going through this? Do you know why? Do you get why he's having to do this? Because he's telling them, God loves you and he saved you in Jesus. Give your life to Jesus. And if somebody ought to be killed for something, it surely ought to be that. That's why he's doing this. That's why he's going through this. Because he's telling them that God loves them and saved them from their sin. He's not telling them to quit this or stop that or do this or go here. He's telling them that Jesus loves them and died for their sin. And they're going to He is courageous, but thoughtful when he interacts with the people who don't want him to go. I did not shrink back to be courageous 
and thoughtful. Three things. Open to change. Number two, caring yet persistent. Three, courageous and thoughtful. Don't shrink back. Don't shrink back. So do you choose the I don't shrink back line for your life? Do you choose that? Some won't. I want you to listen to this. I'm going to end on this note. Some people's hearts will not choose this. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 36. For you have need of persistence, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. For yet a little while, the one who is coming will come and he will not delay. But my righteous ones shall live by faith, by their trust. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not those who shrink back and are destroyed, but those who have faith and preserve their souls. You get to choose. This morning, with what we've looked at, you get to choose. Do I present myself to be talked to and to give talk? To be open to change from this? To be caring yet persistent? To be courageous? Lord, it's up to you to deal with our hearts. I pray you do. In Jesus' name, amen.